accept the one whose faith is weak without quarrelling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another, another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word to teach and inspire. And now, Heavenly Father, as we look upon these words of Paul to the Romans, we ask that you'll send your Holy Spirit to be our guide and counsel. Help us to understand Paul's writings. Help us to understand the message that you're trying to speak to us today. And then through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, help us apply that to our lives for your praise and glory. Amen. Most of the time, my two children get on really well together. But as it seems to be the way with siblings, there are those occasions when they just irritate each other and start bickering and arguing. Usually in these cases, when I wade in to sort it out, I find the same phrase coming out of my mouth. Does it really matter? In the grand scheme of things, what they're arguing about does not really matter. The world's not going to end and no one's life is in danger. But it's not just between my children that I find myself wanting to say those words. There are often times in church when I stumble across a difference of opinion and in my head I'm thinking, does it really matter? Within a church context, there are a myriad of opinions as to how we should use our resources and what our priorities should be. Then there's a broad spectrum of service types and worship styles. Some worship in particular seems to get people stirred up, with some people favouring the organ, others the worship band with the drums and guitars, and then those who prefer a more quiet, reflective service. What I've come to recognise is that no one style is right or wrong. They're just different. The analogy I normally use when trying to explain this is about travelling from A to B. Depending on the length of the journey, I could drive, catch the bus, take a train, or maybe even walk. All of them are different methods of getting from one point to another. With regards to worship styles, it's the same argument. If that style is helping me to meet and engage with Christ, then it's done its job. It's taken me on the journey I needed to go. But it's not just worship styles in church where we get hot under the collar. Remember my spinning plates analogy from last week, where I said in a church context, we'll often be told that we need to do either this, that or the other to be a true good Christian. But all that happens is these extra rules and restrictions 
become a barrier and a distraction to our relationship with Jesus. Sometimes those rules and plates are less about faith and more about culture and opinion. To give an example, I used to run a youth drop-in on a Friday night. It was an outreach project to the unchurched. And as a result of that work, one Sunday, a lad decided to stroll into our church service. He was greeted at the door by a well-meaning lady. But rather than saying, oh, you knew it's great to have you with us today, she instead decided that she should lay out the rules and regulations of the church. We don't chew gum, we don't wear hats. Now I'm about to be flippant, but I don't remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount saying, Blessed are those who remove their hats in church, for they shall inherit the pews. In fact, the only obvious scripture that comes to mind when thinking about people covering their heads is when God told the Israelites to cover their heads as a mark of respect. For that lady, men should not wear hats in church as a mark of respect. That I had no issues with. It was a cultural thing, and I guess her intentions were good. The problem is, when we take such intentions, such cultures and customs, and turn them into religious law, and that is what Paul was challenging in Romans 14. Effectively, Paul was saying, some parts of our Christian living are not black and white. What is right for one person is not necessarily right for another. To understand Paul's teaching, we need to remember that Christianity grew out of the Jewish faith. Within Judaism, faith and culture are so tightly entwined that it's almost impossible to separate them. But as I said last week, a lot of the rules the Jews were trying to live by were not from God, but from man. So when the early Christians started talking about grace and being free from the law, many committed Jews struggled, because quite literally, the rules had changed overnight. Their way of coping was to cling to all they'd known before, their religious observance to the law. But then they bolted Jesus on as an extra. Within the Jewish communities, this worked for a while. But when the Gentiles, the non-Jews, started to come to faith and following Jesus, tensions struck. You see, the Gentiles came from a different cultural understanding and therefore many of the things that the Jews thought were essential to faith were alien to them. And so we find Paul asking the question, does this issue really matter? The first issue Paul focuses upon is food. The Jews had, and still have, a lot of regulations around food. But with Christ we find those rules challenged. We see in Acts chapter 10 and 11, Peter has a vision of a large sheet descending from heaven, and on that sheet were all sorts of forbidden foods. Three times Jesus tells Peter to get up and eat the food from that sheet, and three times Peter refuses, saying it's against his Jewish custom. Eventually Jesus plays the trump card, stating, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. In context, Jesus was preparing Peter to go to the Gentiles to preach the gospel, and he could not allow food to be a barrier. So here Paul talks about food. He goes on to say, some of you only eat vegetables. That is fine, but do not tell others that they must do likewise, and condemn them when they don't. Many years ago I attended a Christian conference where a speaker used two verses from the book of Genesis to justify that we should all be vegetarian. The verses were Genesis 2 verse 16, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, and Genesis 3 verse 18, and you will eat the plants of the field. 
At face value, when you consider just those two verses, it looked like the speaker had a point. Until you consider the bigger picture of scripture and God's word. Firstly, the verses were taken completely out of context. They weren't verses about what we're allowed to eat and what we're not allowed to eat. They were verses about Adam and Eve and the fall. The next bit is about God's design of the human body. If God had intended us only to eat vegetables, why did he give us meat, a teeth that could chew meat? Why did he give us a digestive system designed to cope with meat? And then finally, if you're looking for a biblical mandate, why did he provide quails for the Israelites when they were wandering in the wilderness? And finally, why did he speak to Peter for a dream, revealing to him lots of animals and saying, it's okay, you can eat them. I've made all things clean. Now, before I continue further and upset any vegetarians listening, I'm not saying it's wrong to be a vegetarian. Morally, I respect those who've made the decision not to eat meat. What I am challenging is the judgmental attitude that we all have the habit of falling into when we've made a decision to act in a way that others do not. Poor second example alludes to the Sabbath. The thing that fascinates me regarding the Sabbath, and again, forgive me, I'm being flippant, but it's about those people who make a big deal about Sunday being a holy day of rest and yet expect their vicar to work. Surely, if Sunday is so precious, they're causing their vicar to sin. Of course, the Sabbath is important. As humans, we need to rest. To dedicate a day where we're going to join with others in worship is honourable, and there's a biblical mandate for that. But because someone chooses their Sabbath is going to be on a Wednesday rather than a Sunday, does that make them any less of a Christian? Or what about the Christian who doesn't drink alcohol? Jesus turned water into wine might be one response. But what if that Christian was once an alcoholic, or works with alcoholics? Surely they are right to remove the temptation that drink might bring. Paul, rather than saying we must come to a united agreement, united agreement on all these issues, makes perhaps a controversial suggestion, to paraphrase, on these grey areas, the issue is less about what we do, but the intent with which we do it. As long as what we do, we do for the Lord. Let me say that again. On these grey areas, the issue is less about what we do, but the intent with which we do it. As long as what we do, we do for the Lord. So I can say to God, I'm going to abstain from eating meat, and I may have good reasons for doing so. I'm also free to share my reasons with others. What I'm not free to do is judge those who have come to a different conclusion. What is important is that we live a life that is accountable before the Lord and holds true to the teachings in his word. For as Paul says in verse 12, each of us will give an account of himself to God. We should take to heart verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put a stumbling block or an obstacle in your brother's way. What we need to do links back to last week's talk. We need to act in love. Our actions should be driven by love for one another, rather than point scoring. Why as Christians are we constantly arguing amongst ourselves and putting each other down? There are enough people in the world to do that for us. It's about time we rejoiced that we all know and love Jesus, and look to put our differences aside, and work towards issues that really matter such as revealing Jesus to our friends, family and neighbours, and seeing God's kingdom values 
transform our communities. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that on some of these grey areas in life, we have the truth of your word to guide us. We have the gift of your Holy Spirit to help us discern. Lord, help each one of us to understand your will for our lives. Help us, Lord, to live in peace with one another and to be united on the issues that matter so that we may serve you together in love and truth. Amen.